would say, I bet say Sanchez, you can see that Tom is a good friend of mine. <laughs> <laughs> this mic is working. Could I use it? So, uh, so was that uh, I don't know how to begin because um, I think. Uh, I think, first of all, uh, I am not able to do anything by myself, first of all. And uh, sometimes, you know, when I see all oh, these men resemble, or this one, or this sister, this brother, and I think for me, it's not very difficult to be humble if I see honestly myself, you know, because uh, we're so far, and I am so far from uh, where we should be since uh, we met two parents. The, the very simple but uh, deep question that raised the present uh, young Wikim is uh, we can pray about many things, and we can pray about the world, everything, but in sense, we should pray about ourselves and see where we are since we met two parents. And I couldn't help but to think uh, it's like I feel I didn't really, really begin yet uh, to be the person I, I am supposed to be for father and for true parents. So I like to begin by this uh, few remarks because uh, that's truly really what I feel. It's not uh, it's not anything else. Right? It's what I feel. Um, so let's go back a few months, a few months ahead. So. Uh, I was in Guatemala, in Guatemala, and then I was trying to, to help some program on uh, it's a social services and others. As you, you saw yesterday, we have a, a social arm in Casa that we call World Services. So I was over, and uh, you know, I'm traveling quite a bit, so I'm very really careful with my things. <laughs> Because you know, when you change, always your environment. You cannot uh, assume that uh, you don't have to get too spaced out, so to speak, and especially with your physical things. So I always be very careful whether if I bring a camera or, of course, my passport, my plane tickets, and so forth. And I, I usually just keep it always with me because uh, you know I know it's very problematic if I lose it. And then I was uh, with the, the president of the Lions Club of uh, Guatemala, and then uh, they invited me to uh, to go to a Chinese activity of the one department of the Lions Club, and uh, they told me, why don't, why don't you leave your, your camera in the trunk? <laughs> and then you know, like uh, when you guest, you guest, so. So I was kind of hesitating, no, no problem, you just leave it. I say, well, it's what I did. And when we came back after lunch, there were nothing in the trunk. <laughs> so, and and uh, the problem was that I had my camera, that, uh, that's one thing, but I have also my passport, and which means for us, foreigners to the United States means a visa. And as you do know, maybe it's very, very difficult to get a visa. But that's nothing compared to the third world country. I mean, it's almost impossible to get a visa over there. So then uh, I felt uh, something, something important <laughs> is preparing. And I determined myself to, to even don't be bothered about it, to take responsibility and to restore, but just don't, don't have anything, any give and take with uh, any worry feeling. I just had to look a little uh, embarrassed in front of uh, you know, the president and everybody else, otherwise they would think well, he's crazy or if he doesn't care, so what should we care? <laughs> so, and then it's at that time that I received a phone call, I believe from Tom, saying that, look, uh, yes. father decided a uh, no, full, complete mobilization of the American movement, and he told me, I am not sure that we still exist as an organization. So I said, my God. <laughs> so uh, I said, maybe, okay, because international doesn't exist, what's next? 
and he told me, uh, you know, all seminarians, they have to go city leader. Such father's design. All seminarians, city leader for three and a half years. So I said, well, <laughs> that's quite a change. But uh, OK, let's unite. And then I realized that uh, I have to go back to the United States. So I have to get a visa. So even if it's a problem, you know, I, ha I have to do everything and to go back. So it's what I did. And when I arrived in, uh, in New York, I had such a, such a almost uneasy feeling because uh, the only worry about everybody was to do Father's will. And then they remind me that uh, Father said that if you don't go out this time, don't come back. Just don't come back. Just, you have to go. So I said, I was uh, just wondering what would be my future. You know? And uh, one thing popped up, because of um, the importance of the Catholic Church also in the United States, as you may know, 30% uh, of the Christian communities are Catholic. And as a single church, it's maybe a minority, but still the most powerful group. So, and because a few things that I will explain shortly was, let's say, cooking up, uh, it has been decided that I will go uh, to, to the Vatican during these four months. So I had also a strange feeling at the beginning, because as uh, you may remember, many brothers and sisters came from Europe to the United States, I was the only one going out <laughs> to Europe. So uh, I was not sure that it was the right thing to tell you the truth at the beginning, but still I went. And um, I went over there, and when I arrived over there, uh, I had to bring my son. Why? Because uh, you know, wives, they had to go out also. But but, you know, the regional leader set up some rules. So the regional leaders, most of them say, just one child. And we, we have two. So, so she said, OK, my wife uh, completely united with his father, means that she gave me one child, and she told me, see you in four months. So I, I said, no, I have to do something with my, my child. So I said, well, I, I still have to go over there. So I don't know who will inherit my child, but let's bring him to Europe. I had to, to also to pay his trip, and we, we, we are not that rich. So we went to Iceland, and it was uh, still very hot in New York. So when we arrived in Iceland, uh, I went outside of the plane, and he was freezing. It was really cold. Why am I saying that? Because I, I caught a cold, and uh, uh, I became a little sick. So in meanwhile, you know, uh, finally, Pierre Serac, that you all know, uh, said, OK, we take your child. You know, just don't worry about it. And uh, it will be our contribution to uh, the mission in the United States. So I was very really pleased that uh, he didn't ask me for uh, anything, no money. <laughs> he just took it and then making part of the family. So much so that when I came back, uh, my son was going Pierre, Papa Pierre. <laughs> that was OK. That was OK. <laughs> but he really liked it very much. Um, so then, then I could, uh, I could leave, my, leave my child, and uh, I went to Rome. I like, uh, maybe for your own, uh, for your, your, your own uh, information, to tell you something about the Catholic Church that you may not be aware of. Can you help me with this? Catholic days in the world today? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Five, five hundred million. Five hundred million. Seven hundred million. Six hundred million. Eight hundred million. Two thousand million. I don't think so. <laughs> so actually, uh, according uh, to the recent information, there is. 825 million of Catholic in the world. Do you know how many, uh, is it the biggest region in the world, or the second, or the third, or what? Huh? The second? Who is, who is first? Islam. 
Everybody agrees? Yeah. You're all drunk. No. Actually, that's the biggest region in the world. We have 500 uh, Islamic people in the world, 400 uh, Hinduism. And I, afterwards, you have, do you know how many Protestants you have in the world? 300. Huh? Actually, it's pretty close. You have 340 million. What about autonomy? How many? Close, close. 140 million. So as you can see, uh, the Catholic Church is the biggest religion who ever existed in the space of the earth. So uh, we do know also there is some particularity to it. And one of the particularities, and from its tree representing uh, uh, the Cain side and more like medieval side, so to speak, is very hierarchical oriented. And, and as you know from the Protestant churches, that doesn't emphasize so much the leadership, but more like the personal aspect with the personal salvation. As a result, uh, it's very really difficult. Do you know, for instance, who is the uh, who is the leader of the Methodist Church uh, in your country? Or, or do you know? Eh? It's, it's very difficult because it doesn't really represent a powerful figure. But however, you know, if you know, I am sure that you all know who is the cardinal in your country, the cardinals, or, or the main Catholic leaders. Why? Because they truly represent an authority. So then, I like to define a bit more uh, like a it says a chain of command within the Catholic Church. So let's begin with parishes. What's the next step? Dyson. No. All the parishes, a group of parishes to Jesus. Uh, Dyson. And then? Yes, yes. This is like uh, compared to province, we will say. And the group of province of archdioceses together are under the Episcopal Conference. So the, the body who is like uh, watching over all these uh, different communications is the Episcopal Conference. And the Episcopal Conference is formed with all bishops of the country. So all bishops in one country belong to the particular Episcopal Conference. Every year they vote uh, the president, the vice president, and the secretary general. So the decisions are made by this body when there is uh, some, uh, some particular cases. And then when this particular body publish a letter, official letter, which we call the Episcopal or Pastoral Letter, uh, it has the value of a document. So, for instance, in, in, if in England, or in France, like it happened uh, in 75 or 76, the Episcopal, Episcopal Conference of uh, France published a letter against Unification Church, for instance. This is an official document of the Unification the Catholic Church, which can be used uh, anywhere in the world. Because theoretically speaking, they have to check with the Vatican before to publish this kind of uh, document. So, and uh, do you know, on world level, what is the, the body of the headquarter of the Catholic Church? Do you have any idea? The Vatican. The Vatican. The, the Vatican, uh, first of all, you know, to really understand the Vatican, we have to understand that uh, uh, it has different levels. And if we don't, don't think about it, we may get confused ourselves. For example, as you may know, the Pope will visit, uh, go back to, will visit the Pope, I believe, in October or, or September. Right? From, from a religious point of view, it doesn't make any sense. But, the Vatican is a nation, a sovereign nation. 
When you go to the Vatican, you are in another country. But many people in the Vatican, they have a passport. And one of the best, uh, I would say, example of that, uh, the Vatican is part of the 120 holy ground led by Father in 1975, 65, sorry. So, because it's a, it's a sovereign nation, uh, you have different levels. And one level, I would say, to relate to the others is diplomatical level. Diplomatic. Another level will be like political. And the other level, the Catholic Church, is also the headquarter and the central headquarter of the Catholic Church worldwide. So when you go to, uh, to the Vatican, you know, uh, it's, it's like a, 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 a world, a world and of course a nation. In order to relate to the, to the country, the Vatican, do that through the Secretary of State. <coughs> and exactly as the Secretary of State is served to have relationship with the, uh, the other countries and also to be able to, to regulate and to coordinate the different efforts of what we call these castories, which are like uh, ministers of government and different secretaries and officers who serve as a function of the Vatican. We call these castories. Huh? And the relationship with the Vatican and the other country is being done through the nunciature. And what is the nunciature? This is the Vatican Embassy. Right? So I, I made and had this experience uh, to go and visit the nuns in some countries, and we have to, to understand and to be careful to his position because he's a diplomat, so he will not enter with anything which deals with politics is a country in which he is. So it's a very, very uh, difficult and delicate position, but it also allows the Vatican to be able to have an official representation uh, from a diplomatical point of view in uh, many countries. So through the nunciatures, like the document and everything is that colony. It's like, you know, they say in the Catholic Church, they are like the eyes and the ears, of the poor. So then, these people usually watch out to what they're doing, and usually they don't have, you know, they have to find a good relationship with them in order to be able to have. Yeah, in order to have a, a, a good relationship with the Vatican. So I think I forgot somebody. The Pope. So the Pope, as you know, is elected by the the cardinal, and is elected for life. He has quite a bit of power, but however, he has to really respect uh, the different structures. But he's, if he's clever enough, like uh, this pope, he knows how to change without uh, hurting too much uh, the present situation. So that, that's the way, uh, basically, it works. So you see, like uh, when you visit somebody in the parish, they say, well, I, I cannot do anything. I have to ask uh, my bishop. Sometimes there's a big car here and bishops here. So if my bishop said, OK, it would be OK. The bishop said, well, you know, let's see with the Episcopal Conference. And the Episcopal Conference, they have to watch with the nuncio what they are doing. Otherwise, if they don't do the, uh, what they're supposed to do, then through one of the discussions here, they will receive a sanction and be removed or have trouble. So as you can see, like, uh, the Catholic Church is really very political. That's, uh, that is a reality because of the structures. So it's very difficult for somebody to go forward. So it's very really difficult for us to be able to make clearing roads. One of the reasons why I went to Rome, there's two reasons. Okay? Uh, one reason is four of these 24 discasteries, they uh, are annihilating unification church very, very, very closely. 
and they really know uh, very well everything about us. When I say everything, sometimes much more than you know. <laughs> that is true. Huh? They really watch carefully. And uh, they don't have necessarily a very negative stand, but they had a, a very uh, distant attitude. And then uh, at the beginning, yes, when I came over there, they were, uh, yeah, they were negative. Yeah, we have to say that was true. So, you know, uh, in, uh, in January last year, the Secretary of State, uh, through the Secretary of State, was sent a document to the head of the Episcopal Conference, a confidential document about a uh, unification church. And this was a political move responding to uh, the fact that the University of La Plata from Argentina gave uh, honorary directorate to Father. So, in a sense, you know, the day after the ceremony in the United Nations, uh, when Dr. Argentino came to see Father and then presented formally the honorary doctorate, Father said, because of what you did, he will bring blessing to Latin America and to the Catholic Church. So I thought the first expression of the blessing was rather uh, peculiar, because from this standpoint on, you may not know, but even if they don't tell you, many priests and bishops are aware about this document. But it's, it's not really an official document, it was a confidential information with a really a negative connotation to it, pushing the Catholic leaders and also the laymen to don't participate to our programs. So that, that, that's, uh, that's, that's the truth. Huh? So then um, one of my uh, mission was to work with this uh, particular four, uh, or at least with the Vatican, to try to, to stop <coughs> negativities. Because I, I was also thinking, with all what we do in the United States, maybe few negative you know, comments or information will go to the Vatican. And there are a few people, I met some in the United States, just, just waiting to send something negative, you know, to have some kind of uh, relevance to the Vatican. You know? they, they try to find anything like a good pla platform, what they, say, uh, what they think, in order to have links with the Vatican. So I met one of them, and he was just wanting uh, to know things about us, you know, to send to the Vatican, you know, from, from a negative perspective. So we have this kind of people also on our road. So therefore, unless we do something at this level to try also to inform and to relay, it will be very difficult uh, to just continue our action here. So I went then over there uh, for the purpose. Maybe I can open. The second purpose was, uh, like everybody else in the United States, This is a very big black ball. <laughs> jumbo, jumbo black ball. <laughs> so, uh, like uh, all my brothers and sisters, uh, I was uh, in the mobilization period, and mobilization time, so I went to do my four months to begin with, without knowing what will happen next. And when I arrived uh, in Rome, first of all, as I told you, I went there, I was sick. I was sick. I lost my voice, which is pretty uh, big handicap for somebody. You know. That is our instrument, is in our voice. So uh, I really lost my voice. I could not speak. And then uh, uh, I have to say something, two things. First of all, before I say anything else, I have a great love for the Italian family. But I have still to say few things. So because the Italian family uh, so far have been taking some responsibility for the Vatican, they have been sometimes uh, uneasy with the way some international departments related to the Vatican, because if something happened in this place, the first people to have problem will be them. So, and because they, they understand the intricacy of the Vatican, they're pretty fearful that anybody else coming from, uh, from you know, especially America, will come and then. Uh, make a, a big problem of there. So that, that's, uh, that's why I believe when I came uh, over there, I was not completely welcome. <laughs> and I understand it. Uh, 
uh, no, no big uh, or hard feelings. I understand it. I understood that, uh, of course, of course, they, they, they're wondering what he will be doing in any couple of four months. <laughs> so uh, then um, I had to take the bus <laughs> outside of the airport, and then, uh, and then I choose a, a very cheap hotel. <laughs> and I feel, thanks God, I am a pioneer. So I forgot about uh, whatever my mission was before. And then I felt, you know, like every single brother and sister in the United States, I am just on my own. And then, OK, my place is this place. The Vatican is big, but it's small also. So that's, that's my mission. And uh, because I have this, uh, this, this uh, sickness, I, uh, I became a pretty, uh, uh, also, I would say, uh, Scared, uh, yeah, that's a good word. <laughs> Scared because uh, no way to go, you know, no way to go. You know, in order to inspire me, Ambassador Chavez, who knows Ambassador Chavez? So Ambassador Chavez is, uh, I believe, you know, uh, one of the dearest king children of father. Father loved him very much. And uh, he's a, a career diplomat, so he knows it all, he knows it all. And then if you go with him in one country, you, you will be amazed. Any country that I know so far, you know more people than uh, that your, your best friend or your best relation would have. He knows everybody, everybody, everywhere. So it's just absolutely amazing person. And because he was you know, since this, that long time in the diplomacy, he knows how things work. So when he heard that I was going to the Vatican, he, he just sent me two words. <laughs> just two words. What's for? <laughs> What's for? Do you want to educate the poor? He has four PhDs. What's for? No way. So you want, what do you want to do over there? Say, so, well. <laughs> so, uh, and then he said, look, I tell you what you could do. Uh, like a, in terms of if you were a little smarter, you know? I tell you what you could do. You know, the Jews, uh, they understood that just after World War II, they have to have a good relationship with the Vatican right? after they, they were a state. So they went over there, and then the first thing they understood is that never speak about theology or religion in this place. So they went over there, and then they make an office, friendship, uh, <laughs> Israel, the Catholic, and, and they make themselves valuable to help. So they went to have this kind of, or do, do, do you like to have a car to go from here to there? Or what, what will be your basic needs? I know you need this type of book for your library, <laughs> this type of money for uh, your social action. So by doing so, uh, they were able to really gain a good, good relationship with them to the point that they could have some of their people. And he said, the, the only thing you have to think of it just will cost you a few millions of dollars. <laughs> so <clears throat> then, uh, is there anything else you try to do? Uh, you know, like uh, he okay. shook his head, uh, like, you know, he made me understand, you're so good and so nice, but you don't really understand what's going on. So I said, then with this uh, kind of a spiritual uh, <laughs> background and, and simulation, I was over there with uh, this is a. Uh, the special welcoming I had, and with my physical state, <laughs> then I felt completely your place. I have to admit. So what to do in that case? You know, I went uh, in some uh, state in, to, to give a testimony, and some people said, well, why don't you sleep? <laughs> why don't you, you eat, or you, you move on, anything? So what can we do? What can I do? What would have been your attitude? Pray, pray, huh? pray. Praying? Praying, yeah. Okay. Is, when, when you feel all place miserable and then very, uh, very, very small, uh, you know, what, what can we do? <laughs> huh? <laughs> huh? Father, when he was Father? Alone. yeah, it's what? becoming pretty conceptual at one point, you know. <laughs> but that's true. We have to hang on to it. Witness, <laughs> witness, witness. Crying. <laughs> Crying, that's a <laughs> good thing. Like that, that's a normal thing to do. Right? Yeah, for confession. To eat. <laughs> <laughs> that was so uh, active, that's necessary. Yeah. To serve. To serve, yeah. That's something that we think we should do. Huh? 
to make some unity with someone else. Someone. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, you know, one thing I determine myself you know, is not to think too much, first of all. Huh? And then, second, to keep faith. You know, no matter what, no matter you know, what happens, I just will unite with what Father said. Because, you know, if we think, uh, we were there, I remember, with uh, Tom and Bill and a few others, quite a few others, when Father went right from uh, Phoenix House, when he finished his time, to Belvedere. And then the first thing he said to us, it was uh, 1 o'clock, uh, August 20th, 1.15, he said, uh, I have successfully completed the restoration of the foundation of Christianity. From now on, it's another time completely another time. And from now on, uh, we are in the same position that 40 years before, like everything is possible. He said, now, no problem. You go over there and then you bring the victory because the foundation is restored. So, you know, I, I keep that very, very, very deeply in myself. And especially in that moment, I said, well, I don't understand. I don't see how. And I, I, I just don't want to, I just keep faith and what's the second thing to do? After that. To speak. Eh? To speak. Go to the church. Yeah, but the second thing to maybe asking to God, but you know, even in this case, you, I'm not sure you can feel God or God can listen to you. So what, what, can, what can we do? I think what, what I did is, to set up a condition, you know. I am not enough in the church to understand even, you know, if I don't feel anything, if I don't understand anything, at least if I lay a condition, I know like intuitively like something will happen or, or things will work or change. So I treat it first and say, okay, I will make a condition. And then this condition, I decided to make a condition, a special condition. Really a special condition. Why? Because, you know, when Father came, and then when we received the holy water ceremony, and when we went through the holy water ceremony, he said that through this particular event, we all raised up to Messiah on the tribal level. Mm. So this kind of thing I just wanted to believe it and to try to live it. So therefore, I felt I know I cannot pretend to be on that level. I know. I just uh, then. The only thing I can have and I can do is try to set up a condition we can make for my weaknesses or make for my shortcoming or my, my lack of foundation to stand on this level. That's the only thing which can be acceptable to God and which can free me from uh, worrying too much, do I do the right thing or maybe you know, if it doesn't work it's because of uh, you know, me or whatever. Then to make a condition as a foundation on a personal level and for the mission. Why so? Because I understood one thing. You know what, what told me Ambassador Chavez? Uh, I thought a lot about it. Because, uh, you, know, you know, and Father spoke uh, pretty much in that, uh, that term uh, in these recent weeks. Uh, we have to achieve success, and we have to understand how it works outside, and we have to be able to make it with our own standards. So when this type of people said, look, you need money, then you have to understand he's speaking because of his experience, and you know, you know in this place, uh, well, we need the uh, influence, you know, political influence, so to have a powerful friend, and we need money. That, 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 that's the truth. So uh, I thought about it, I thought about it, and then I thought, well, what can I do? What what, what do we have? What do we have? Uh, so the, the very hopeless people, you know, like, uh, seemingly rejected, but what do we have? What do we have? Truth. Huh? Yeah, but do you think truth can make up for money? <laughs> Sometimes, yes. Sometimes, yes. Also? Yeah, some, some response. You know. yeah. Actually, yeah. Hey, what, what do we have in his, the spiritual world? Because politics money is influence, how to influence people. The heart of influencing people, to convince people. So what do we have is a spiritual world. So if we don't believe it, that's a choice. But the reality is, is if we truly think the highest spiritual world is with us, 
And if we set up a, uh, like a, a foundation for the spirit world to work, then he has to work. No, it has to work. So it's, it's, what, uh, it's what I thought, you know. Okay, make a foundation to raise you up to the Messiah level, at least on the identity condition. And then, you know, to move the spiritual world, which is at this level, we have uh, to have some kind of subjective position, then uh, that's the only way, you know, a foundation which uh, can allow the spiritual world to trust us and then to be able to work. So it's what I did. And right at the beginning, I could understand something which uh, since then served as a, as a foundation and served me to, to see, uh, actually to see the, the development of our activities. And I always, always have this, uh, this theme in mind. It's, uh, I, I can show you what it is. And I showed to President Kim, because he came to Italy during these four months. And as you know, President Kim, usually uh, you cannot speak uh, too long with him. You speak within 15, 20 minutes, that's OK. But uh, uh, we stay one hour and a half. And he was really uh, deeply interested. And he took my drawing. And then uh, somehow he agreed with it. So that's why uh, I can share with you. You know, one big, 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 big mistake of Satan was to take Hongjin in life. It was unbelievable. Like, we still don't really fully understand how far the problem could advance because of this. But that was one big mistake. And I remember in, uh, it was in, uh, I think in December 30th, 1983, when father came back straight from Korea to Poughkeepsie Hospital, he went uh, to see uh, Hong Jin Lee with mother. And right after, I think, or the day after, with the children, he gathered the family. And they went to the Poughkeepsie Chapel. And there, father proclaimed uh, the, how is it, the uh, unification. No, the, uh, he offered his own beloved son for the sake of total unification. And then in this particular ceremony, Father um, defined uh, two or three times, once in one prayer and twice in some discourse, what it meant. He said, through this unification ceremony, and when I heard, you know, that many times Father says something, but uh, it, it doesn't ring a bell, you know, even so, you know, we unite and we understand. And then it's kind of hard to understand, like total unification. It's just, uh, yes, OK, but uh, uh, hard to understand it. Uh. So he said, uh, through this ceremony is a condition for the unification, the unity between God, father, and mother. And then, the unity between true parents and true family. The unity of the true family with the true, the blessed children. In this order. The unity of the blessed children with the blessed couple. The unity of the blessed couple with unification church. The unity of unification church with Christianity. The unity of uh, Christianity with the free world or democratic world. And then the unity of the free world with the communist world. So 
I understood uh, you know, somehow something was going on. Something was going on. And then uh, on August 16, 1885, Father could do uh, the ceremony of total, of total victory. And he could do so because uh, he sent Yojinim in uh, July and August, just prior to this, 1985, he sent Yojinim in to uh, a workshop of uh, the Blanche children. And then the second cap convention in Japan. And father said that uh, they could unite completely with Yojini. And doing so, it was the first time that a king and evil relationship was fully realized. And through this uh, foundation, for the first time ever, the base of the true parents were settled down. And of course, in the position of the second generation, center on your genie. Because of this victory, father could proclaim so they have total victory. And one of the most important meaning is now these three points between God, true parents, true family. And as you know, through three points, we can have like a straight line. And now uh, there is like uh, the certainty that the tradition of uh, God and true parents will be perpetuated forever and ever. That is the type of meaning that uh, this uh, total victory has. So it's incredibly important. So, and Father said that because of this uh, realization for the first time, it seems uh, incredible, of, uh, of unity of King and Abel, it will bring an incredible unity with our movement. And Father said that some blessed couple in Korea who could not unite for, for years, because of the unity uh, which begin with their children centered on your genie, they could also overcome uh, and begin to unite. So Father said that unity will come in our movement. And on, uh, as you know, on August 20th, Father could do the holy water ceremony, which, uh, which truly, uh, for me, it's also one of the consequences of the second biggest mistake of Satan, to put Father in jail. That was a mistake that uh, he still don't realize, and we don't realize what it means. But one of the years come, as you do know, Father gave us home church for the purpose to raise us uh, to the level of tribal Messiah. But when he came back of Danbury, he could offer the holy water ceremony and say that but now you can stand on the Messiah position. So much so that you can go back to your own family and just by your own example, be able to reflect the idea of the principle. That's why shortly after, he advises brother and sister to go to their family and to visit the ministers and others from their family place. Of course, it doesn't mean that we should not or we will not have to do home church. We still we have to do home church. There's no question, but we already have inherited the title of the tribal messiah. And further define, we have, however, to follow a course of three and a half years. He actually was three years and four months, but a course of three and a half years. And he said that during that time, we stand on the position of the third generation. But, unite with the spirit 
of the second generation, we can reach Canaan. in these four and a half years. And if we, if we don't succeed to do so, then what will happen if, of course, we lose ourselves in the desert, wilderness, or to go back to Egypt. For me to understand that father, in uh, this, in a September, December '85, given us these four months, made that that the time of unity between the Christian churches and Unification Church, and this will have to be done mainly through the Causa Providence. Something I understand also right from the start that I, I begin to have like a to, to have a say that things develop truly from an internal point of view first. And I understand one thing: unless we succeed to unite at this level, there's almost no possibility for us to be able to reach the Christian churches. It's as simple as that. Unless we are successful in this test. King and Abel, we cannot reach the Christian church yet. Why? Because as we do know that the foundation of systems and through which the, the Messiah can come. So if we are not able to like remove our fallen nature or to be in the position to be able to receive you know, through the Messiah's guidance and the Messiah presence, uh, we cannot really go to the, to the other steps. I do believe, of course, that this is God's providence. This is not our providence. And this is God's providence. So he will find a way, but we will kind of block the, the flow of Father if we don't realize what is our internal responsibility. So with this in mind, uh, Heavenly Father put me in a very special situation because uh, in, uh, uh, please try to understand the context. I want to share an experience with you. And I don't want to speak about people, uh, nation, or anything else. But, but I have to relay a few, few situations for you to understand uh, what I went through and how I dealt with it. And I, I hope it can serve uh, of, of some use for you. But you know, there was somebody uh, wonderful working before me in this place, in the Vatican. And um, this particular person, which is a, you know, a good person, did not really understand uh, what I was coming for. And because of this, so as a threat, my presence in this place. So rather than to, to try to unite, uh, this person tried to, uh, to don't unite and to, <laughs> to, to get me out of the way, uh, quite frankly. So. Uh, but then I realized that uh, I can never give up on my unity with this person. No matter what, she can, she, can, uh, she can hire somebody to kill me, I still will love her and then take her with me. Otherwise, I know there's no way the problems can go on. You know, we are just in a certain place, in a certain situation. We didn't ask for it, but we have to assume the responsibility. And I remember you know, I was during all that time reading uh, Father's speech, which is God's will in the world. And uh, Father explained at one point, because of the lack of unity, it just tremendously, uh, actually because of the lack of unity in America with the first missionary, Father did not have a foundation. So he had to pick up and do the thing by himself. Not because they did not work hard, but because they did not understand this basic point that that was the first responsibility. I said, we are in the same position. I am in the same position. And even if we see you know, this, uh, no, we see already now, you know, like a, the statistics couple, they, they truly like at such a level that we cannot treat them. But at that time, they were sometimes younger than us in the church, <laughs> like us. So, and then in a foreign country, many difficulties. So maybe uh, we have to put everything in perspective and to understand. But one thing is important, is true unity for the best of any mission. 
So I was determined to never leave God and any prayer before to find peace and before to find a way to unite. I promise myself, no matter what happened, this particular person may say that about me, to these leaders, to this person, even you know, going into prison and king or whatever. For me, that doesn't make any difference. I won't say a word to anybody about it. And I will do everything to unite in order to make God successful in the mission. Why? Because I knew, just is that if I refuse like, this spiritual battle, then I know God won't work. And I know uh, no matter how much I do, it won't work. It just won't work. Because he just can work with the help of the spiritual world. And then we need to have a foundation. In a sense, I am very grateful because I was pushed a little further in my limitation you know, to stretch my heart. Doesn't matter. Even no matter how I am treated, I know that's my responsibility. And I will do it. So God worked in such a way that uh, this term got another mission. And then this actually pushed towards the unity with the Italian family and ultimately with President King. And because I maintain this kind of uh, stubbornness to don't be caught by my own spirit or, or by my keen feeling and to truly fight in order to be free with God, then because of this, uh, the whole situation moved around. Whole situation moved. And then we could be able to, uh, to have a truly wonderful unity with the Italian family. So as I reported the, what was the activity to the Italian family, then we begin to work together as a truly brother, mature brother, and then we could go on with our work and with the blessing of President King. So I felt, you know, if, if, if I just uh, was tired to fight, all these things would not have happened and probably would have occurred. And then, because of this, God could work. So I feel we're all standing in this position. Right? And then we have really, really to fight, really to fight. And the only way we can fight if we understand the spirit of the second generation and to him with the spirit. And I really feel like uh, we have to leave our old clothes in the desert. We have to take new clothes, new spirit, and then to go home uh, you know, like a very, um, very happily and newly. We have to feel, you know, no matter how I behave and what I did, you know, no matter, I am a new person if I can unite with this spirit. And if I do that, I could follow up uh, all the caravan until Canaan. So that's our responsibility internally, and my responsibility internally until 88. So by doing so, it's what I wanted to do, and to realize an internal foundation, like spiritual foundation, but also like more substantial foundation in terms of a unity, in order to be able to go on. So as Tom told you, can we avoid this uh, reverberation? As, as Tom told you, um, maybe I, you know, I have space so I can use everything. Uh, I decided to pray uh, 40, 40 days, two hours, just in order to unite with your genuine spirit. And just, just, you know, I understood, I understood you know, we have to unite. You know, Father is speaking now, your genie, you know, we have always to understand. You know. Father says something, and then, uh, okay, now he's our leader, what it means. And so, but we have to unite, and then the same spirit. Like Tom told you, uh, your genie is such a special person. He just, for me, it's like sun spirit or, or bright spirit, just breaks through everything. A beautiful, incredible, powerful spirit, and happy and wholesome spirit. So how to inherit something, and how to understand that so inherit is some, something from his spirit, we can actually get out of our old spirit and be able to get through. So uh, then, in order to do so, so that's why right. you know, I choose 12 to 2, to have you know, the same, same, same situation that he has, and uh, to begin to unite with his spirit. So the first 40 days, Yeah, first 40 days, we pray 12 to 2 a.m. Yeah, huh? So I was uh, with uh, some, someone that uh, some of you may know for the Italian family, with Lorna Russo. And then I was also at uh, some time uh, helped by uh, my Italian brother who is in charge of Causa, Franco Pasquale. Maybe you can stand up like a, you know, he helped me uh, many times over there. So. <laughs> If 
spread many hours. <laughs> so then um, we decided, and then in my whole life, I never had such an experience during this first holiday. An incredible experience. So much so that uh, you know, I, I was afraid. I was afraid because I couldn't stay with the central figure. And then uh, unbelievable experience. Like even if I think or pray sometime about it, I can reconnect the special spirit of this special prayer. For instance, one day, I, like uh, the value, incredible value of true parents. Like even God is less than true parents in a sense. Everybody needs true parents. You know, everybody, everybody. But within the speech world, billions and billions of people, owners, the billions of people, and God, you know, everybody has to go through true parents. There are no, no greater value and, and being and then time and space. <laughs> Just everything goes to true parents. And when we think that true parents are owner, the the center of all universe, of all time, space, for eternity, are on earth. And that's like such a brief time. Brief time that we are on earth. And I am called, like, that we are called to be able to help them. So for me, it was incredible to see, to, to see like a, a, more than a diamond shining in our kind of time and space, and then see God almost small in comparison to true parents, because he, he had to also rely on true parents. You know, big as it is, big as it is, he, he is like everybody else here. You know, we have to go to true parents to be able to be saved. So true parents, unbelievable value of true parents. Another time, Rome is a very special place. <laughs> the only place I can compare Rome to in terms of speed is New York City. <laughs> Rome is incredible. I don't think you have more beggars than any place in the world. Sorry, sorry, but that's true. <laughs> this unbelievable. Like the speech of the world is very active, but very crazy. But very active. Yeah. Like if we see, can we can we imagine Rome? Can we imagine Rome? Can we imagine what the Romans did? Yeah. Today we go to the soccer game when the, they were going to see the Christian be persecuted. So, and then it was just before the 4th of October, and train, during three days, I truly felt, what the foundation? Because I was praying, to, Father said, uh, now the foundation is restored. Father said so, so I believe it. But when I go outside, and when I speak to a canon or a priest, he doesn't understand this truth, you know? <laughs> so maybe I speak as good, but he's you know, still reserved about it. So what does it mean? Because before, the whole structure was the church structure through which Father could work. But today, you know, what it is, what it is, what is this new foundation that Father is talking about? But then I understood, really, and I, I, I almost had a living experience. The foundation is the blood of the Christian and the blood of great men in history. That's our foundation. That's truly, really, first of all, the spiritual foundation. And for instance, you know, during three days I could feel my foot, my feet within the blood of Christians. And turn the, that's our roots, you know, like that, that is the bottom on which we, we're working. You know. If I am here, it's not because of me or what I am doing, but I am just responsible because I am here at that time. So I cannot allow uh, you know, the problem to don't go right because you know, nothing to do with us. You know, we, should, we don't ask, but we are here, and then we have the whole foundation. And I heard afterwards that Father said on October 1st that for the first time, the, the ceremony that he did in 1976, and for the day of the Vicar of Heaven, in which all uh, religious leaders went to bow down to Father, in order for them to help the followers to work, he said, Father said that now they could fully work. And especially like all the Christian and everybody, they could fully work with us. So that is our foundation. And I felt one time, one time, like uh, the like like one lion, you know, taking part of my body, you know, like just unbelievable experience. Uh, that what the Christian has to go through. And there are the people who are helping us, who are helping me in the spiritual world. So if if I'm like a tourist of the restoration, or if I don't really uh, live up to a certain standard, they will never, they won't, they won't work with me, like uh, what I do. So I feel, uh, unless, unless you know, I am truly united with them, and just uh, willing to die, 
will need to die for my mission. If I don't have this, this attitude to be willing to die, there's no way in the world these people will take me seriously and come with me. Before to come here, I was in Rome, and uh, I had the chance to visit uh, a church which is called the New Jerusalem Church, which was built uh, around uh, 400, 500 years after Christ, so just uh, within the wave of the persecution. And the whole of this church is just filled with the major persecutions. And it serves as a recall, historical recall, to know where the persecution took place. I think it's one of the only ones. And uh, as, I, as I thought before, that like most of the persecution were taking place is, uh, in uh, Colosseum, or the, but actually it took place uh, you know, elsewhere in Rome. But when I, I saw this picture you know, last time, I just couldn't help but be so moving and touched. You won't believe the persecution these people went through. You just won't believe what, what the, the evil mind could come up with to, to, to persecute these people. I took some pictures, and as you will see, uh, this, uh, this picture, like this family are not so good because they're very old. But when we, you will see the type of persecution, you know, the people who are in the same position that we are went through, then we have to understand that the people who are in the spiritual world now to help us. That's a maquette which is representing this, uh, this particular church. And uh, it's uh, rather symbolic. I will not enter into much detail. But also, uh, yeah, we, we can go on. So you will see all these pictures. They are, they are not so good because the painting are not so good. But you will see, this is historical recall. And like we have uh, who was persecuted, uh, which emperor at what time, and the special place. So this is not like some fantasy pictures. Huh? That's uh, actually what happened. So uh, then, as I, I told you, like the first, the very first four years were unbelievable for today in terms of spiritual realization. Right? The feeling and then uh, some kind of very beautiful, uh, sometimes uh, loving feeling of Heavenly Father. But most of all, I would say, a call to stand on our position if we want to work for God today. So during these uh, 40 days, we had to find our Danbury. You know, Father says, you have to, to find your own Danbury. So but we have to come up with, with something. So shall we steal something and just go to jail? Or what? I found one thing, you know. As you know, Father said, in Danbury, he was in the position to serve the hell of hell. Because if this society is hell, then the bottom of society in the prison, which put like the truly the, the bottom of this hell, as in the hell of hell. So his father said, by serving the hell of hell, I kind of opening the way for everybody's salvation. So how to find our hell of hell? Actually, we were really uh, helped to find our hell, our hell. We went to work with uh, Mother Teresa sisters. You know them? The sister of charities. You don't know them? They have a blue. Uh, you know, blue stripe, and then they are like in sari. So we went to work with them, and I tell you, it was some kind of experience. Why? Because can you imagine the philosophy of this order? The philosophy of this order is the following one. To go in the worst place in, uh, in on earth. To go and to pick up the people that nobody wants, and to serve them as children of God. <coughs> That's the philosophy of this order. And then the second philosophy is uh, and to take the sick and dying people and help them to die in peace. That's what this, uh, this sister are doing. So I really feel that they're standing on the very top of Christianity. Why? Because they inherited Father's heart, which is to, to go to the world with, uh, and to serve the world with a father and mother attitude. Right? Really, a student of the servant and a father's heart, mother's heart. So when we went there, it was actually uh, quite a challenge, quite a challenge, because sure they have uh, Jesus, and, and they, they truly love Jesus. They have truly living, living faith in Jesus. Unbelievable. So, and then you won't believe what they are capable to do, you know. 
I remember uh, at the very beginning when I saw one sisters, you know, one one of the beggars came with one one table foot just completely uh, mixed up and then uh, just very strong and uh, of course completely dirty. I saw the sister like uh, taking this foot as if it was the most precious thing and then just uh, give, like a baby, you know, like a, a newborn baby just giving the love to this foot and then uh, and then I felt you know, myself, uh, can I do that just normally? And then give the love, give the love and treat him that well. And if I cannot do that, what, what, what is the level of my salvation? And, and what kind of love I can give? If she can give this, this nature of love, then with true parents we have and I have to do better. So uh, fortunately God helped me very much right at the start. Because a uh, few days after, you know, we went almost every day during these forty days. A few days after, went, went somebody, and then everybody could smell him before he was actually in the room. He was completely drunk, and then he had uh, not more than wetted his pants. He <laughs> just, just uh, he was completely, uh, completely. Uh, Imagine. Uh, <laughs> so, and then he came, and if they are sisters, then they cannot take directly care of men. And I had to go at that very time. So, and uh, I, I, I had an appointment. So, in a sense, I was almost happy to have an appointment. <laughs> to have an excuse. But I felt, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. You know? I felt, uh, you know, like when Father was in jail, uh, Mr. Kimmel told us for many things, uh, very dirty thing. He even didn't want Mr. Kamehameha to do it. He said, that's my job. You know? I have to do it. And I felt, wait a minute, that's my job. <laughs> so I said to the sister, don't worry, I will do it. <laughs> but you know, he was drunk. And he was... So uh, it was quite a bit of fight. But you know, I felt, no matter what, how, how to love this man and to give him dignity as a child of God and for him to not be embarrassed by the situation. So I couldn't manage okay until this day he likes me very much. So I couldn't manage it, but I felt there was so much of so, uh, limitation and God gave me a few other occasions you know, to overcome. But how to, uh, to truly uh, get the bottom and serve them? So it's what we did. And as doing so, I felt we can get like a, you know, like a, a graduation from this as a foundation to work and to have something to say to these monsignores, the cardinals. Eh? And what to do? I think that was a foundation. Also, you know, so that was more like a service level. You know? We did also a, a condition. Rome, brother and sister were doing conditions, witnessing conditions. So we went on these witnessing conditions. And I think it was absolutely important somehow to, uh, to speak God's word, to speak the divine principle, to be able to truly express uh, our, our faith completely. Because in this particular setting, like Father, we made a condition. We don't say one word about uh, who we are or what we want. No, we just serve. We just, nothing else than serve, nothing else. And then we did a condition or so to read uh, God's will and the world. As you know, God's will and the world uh, is uh, the compilation of uh, 38 speeches that Father gave over 25 years of time, and Father carefully picked them while he was in Danbury. And then when the day he went out, he gave to the ministers, the uh, uh, 1,700 minister friends in Washington, representing world Christianity, he gave them this book, saying that God's way and the world. So if we imagine, if we truly believe that, that's representing God's will and the world. So I had this experience that I do believe many of you have also, is what Father said you know, like 15 years ago, or 10 years, five years ago, is incredibly true. And then we just completely missed the point at the time. But now we can see it's relevant. And I will say, you know, this 
this particular thing gives me the feeling of providence more than anything else. And you know, we need this feeling of providence. It's what we need to really understand we live in the providence. We all join, or almost all, if we join the church, is not only because of the line principle, it's because of this feeling of providence. We have to join the ship right away. Because we understood what was going on. That's why we jump. So we need, and I need, mean, like, always this thing of providence. Because, you know, we can have motivation, but what can move us really, really move us, I believe that's the feeling of providence. That we are on God's time schedule, and then we have to be part of it. Also, as I told you, like, uh, the spiritual world in Rome is uh, pretty active and, and pretty crazy. So, uh, you know, we have to have and to receive the help of the spiritual world. But in order to do so, you know, we have to organize the spiritual world. Yeah. I am no stage John. I don't have vision, <laughs> revelation, nothing. But I know and trust the principle. And I know that somehow, you know, through my own thinking, uh, we can truly organize the spiritual world. And if we truly do God's will, then the spiritual world has no other things to do than to help us. But in order to do so, it needs to be organized and educated. So, you know, through service, we could truly do two things. First of all, to bring the people, you know, that's one of the whole controversy. What is more important, action or words? And some people say, if you don't do anything, then forget it. The other word, what gives you life is truth. Uh, so, so this is to, uh, how to gain you know, the cooperation and the unity of these people. I think you know, uh, that's why we were serving. And also, you know, within the spiritual world, like in Rome, in Rome you have like, like incredible, incredible front lines. If you think about all these Christians, can, you, can we imagine that uh, you know, they knew what will happen to them? They knew what, what can happen to them. And then when we studied church history with a, of the town, uh, we, we understood that during the time of persecution, the harshest persecution, that's the time where the Christian was the most successful and the most people came in. Mm -hmm. So they really knew what would happen to them. But then they did it. So they were willing to die for their faith. Just willing to die. But if you see this picture, not, not to die, just to be incredibly persecuted for their faith. And it, but what happened? In the other side of the fence, yet all these people who, who laugh at it, who were very happy to see them completely uh, destroyed and tortured, it was their spectacle. Can you imagine the kind of people who are right there? So how to get rid of these people spiritually? And I think if we have so many strange people in this city, it's because of this spiritual world. So by doing the same condition that Father did, trying to serve the hell of the hell, if you see the beggars and bad living, you know, uh, there is no question. They don't take responsibility for themselves, and they're truly selfish. They don't care. They just don't care. It's amazing to see how selfish they are sometimes. You know? Like, they receive this food freely. But if somebody has more than them, they all shout out. Why did he have that and not? Jam away. I was amazed, you know. The, these people, they speak anything about anybody. And they have this kind of, uh, like prisoners and these people, they, they treat the kings and queens of uh, resentment and uh, of rumors. So, but then, you know, they all respect the sisters. They, can, they don't respect anybody in the world, but they respect the sisters. They res why? Because they feel God's love and something blocks them. And because it's true God's love, they they, they, at least they cannot do anything against them. They have to back up, to back up. So same with the spiritual. Serving these people, then we can push away, push away, push away, and then be able to grow the good spiritual world. And by, by also, you know, uh, seeing God's work, we can attract and educate the people uh, sentient on words. And by reading about God's will and the world, uh, truly to educate the spiritual world about the providence. So that's what the, the first 40 days. And at the second 40 days, we decided to, 
to pray uh, with, to change. So we decided to wait 4 to 5 uh, a.m. Why? I am not sure. But we decided to pray 4 to 5. Ah, yes, 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 yes. Because uh, father and mother did uh, the, the ceremony of, uh, of the day of the Victoria of Florence at 4 a.m. So then, yeah, that's what we say. We will pray four, four to five. Then uh, what happened? You know, I I began this condition September 18 because uh, I went a little late. So in order to batch up with this uh, four months, we began this condition. You know, 18 days within the other condition, right? You know, to to be able to to be at the same time schedule like United States and this four months. You understand what I mean? So during any day we were praying 12 to 2 and then 4 to 5. It was a little difficult, but believe it or not, it became much more difficult when we had to pray just 4 to 5. Because we said, okay, we pray 4 to 5 and after we do anything, but we don't go back to bed. So we did that. And I tell you, the two first days, my, my spirit went down and uh, I just lost all my power, and then I really felt completely tired. And I said, look, you know, we have to be reasonable. You cannot go and see a cardinal and fall asleep. <laughs> you just cannot, you know. And it, but it's, it's also, uh, you know, like, a, then you can see, look, I knew these people, they were strange, etc. Et so because we truly really represent uh, the true parents. So, um, so I was truly really desperate. What to do? To change the condition? What to do? What to do? I am sure you made the same type of dilemma in your life. Quite a few times, I am sure. So what, what to do? What to do? What to do? To, uh, to change? Well, but, but you have a mission. So if, if you know, in the name of your foundation, you are not able to do your mission, then use less. Huh? No sleep. No, no sleep. Take some tablets at home. Oh, tablet, tablet. I was taking some time uh, espresso. Yeah, <laughs> but still, still, uh, still work to a limit. You know? Afterwards, we are still at home. So, you know, I thought, well, what would have done father in the same case? Eh? What would have done father? What do you think father would have done? Eh? What? Pray more. Pray more. <laughs> it's what we thought. <laughs> so if it doesn't work, four to five, let's try four to six. Even though it does not make any sense, let's try four to six. So in the very same day that we tried uh, four to six, we ended up to pray four to seven. Oh. And then no problem. <laughs> no problem. Really, no problem. That's the truth. Of the, the spiritual truth, the spiritual element, no problem. It was absolutely amazing. And it's also this time, you know, during the transition time between 12 to 2 and 4 to 5, while we're praying, that one of our good friends from the United States, uh, Bishop uh, Ma, it's, a, it's an Orthodox bishop, came to visit and then came to help us to work in Rome. So he ended up to be uh, with me in a small hotel room, and I said, what <laughs> what will happen you know, because I have to carry on and then if you see what kind of life we you know we, we involve in you say no <laughs> okay we, we, we will you know, maybe say strange story about okay. so I say um, what to do so I try at the beginning look that's a very special time for us even though you know, it's too much little, but please understand that uh, you know very unusual, but uh, I will pray 12 to 2 and then maybe a little bit in the morning, uh, 45. <laughs> so, so, so he was uh, already uh, looking at me as he was, I was very strange. But anyway, I said, well, better to go ahead uh, if, and then to do it. So at the beginning, I will admit that he had a little hard time, two or three days. And then uh, the time passing on, <laughs> he got used to. <laughs> you know, Many times, you know, the sister or the brother, they had to knock on my door to get me up. So, uh, and uh, two or three times, you know, I was, I was sleeping and then uh, you know, knocking on the door and then 
I did not, I did not wake up. So he told me, Roger, that's time. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets completely involved into the spirit. And he did not want me to miss part of my commission. <laughs> and it's a matter of fact, you know, well, through this experience, he, he just had so much respect for us. Already he knew the members, but he said, now that I live with you, <laughs> I understand what kind of people you are. You are not only dedicated and serious, but you are truly spiritual people. And then this particular person is a bishop, you know, much you know, older and then respected than I am. But even though now, because of this experience, he truly standing on objective position to us. Uh, when I say us, is myself, but also Kazar officer and Dr. Park and True Father. To the point that uh, we can call him any time, and we did, <laughs> uh, a short while ago, to give uh, a mass because we needed somebody. You know, I, I call him you know, uh, at uh, 5 o'clock, telling him. 5 p.m. Yeah, 5 p.m. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I told him, yeah, no, that's just a little side story. And I told him, please, uh, we need you. <laughs> we need you. And he was uh, two, 2,000 miles away, Phoenix and Washington. You know? So I said, I, I just need you. Uh, we need you. Can you please come and say mass for us, for our participants, uh, to our seminar? He said, Well, I said, We really need you. He said, Okay, okay. So I checked the plan and I will see. Call me back 30 minutes later. So I called him back 30 minutes later and I, I had a little, little girl. I knew you. So I was really embarrassed. Okay, where is your father? He said, he, he went to the airport. <laughs> <laughs> so he was already gone. It just, it was just one strike. So, it is really such a type of person. Uh, they truly accept unification church as able. They keep their faith and religion. They're completely, completely loyal to us and completely supportive. So, and at the end of the time he stayed wrong, 15 days, I remember, because he was not sure what he achieved. So I said, well, you happy? They said, well, okay. And he stood up and he said, he put, he put it like that. He said, if somebody say anything about unification church, I stand and defend it. I said, okay, very good. So, so that really, like, his, his faithfulness was completely one and completely supported. So uh, what this, this particular, uh, particular condition was completely different than the first one. Actually, during this condition, I was missing the first one. Like, it was very beautiful. But, uh, but this one, very tough. Very, very tough. Like, you know, the first one was really the spiritual foundation. The second one, we began to visit a lot of people. So, for instance, we ended up to visit the major university. And when I say university, I'm speaking about the Vatican University. There is these five of them. And to visit the president. Why? Because if this person can accept from a philosophical point of view that causa is acceptable and that doesn't go against the dogma, uh, religion, faith, or, or, or whatever, that don't, that don't touch this theological thing, then uh, we can go elsewhere and say, look, you know, your people said from an academical point of view, no problem. So let's go ahead. So that's why I thought it was very important to meet these people. Then I went to meet the spiritual group. Do you know Focolaris? Yes. yes. And uh, the charismatic renewal movement, yeah? yeah? So these kind of people who want to live their life of faith in a daily manner, right? to truly live a good, maybe layman, but truly good life of faith and good life of spirit. So we went to visit them you know, to, to establish uh, some connection. And uh, I, could, I could tell you more another time, but it was also the Christian churches as a condition, because there is very few of them in Rome, outside of the Catholic Church. <laughs> and then uh, <laughs> Um, oh, <laughs> in the Vatican. <laughs> 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 
no? <laughs> so, so this, uh, this particular condition was a tribal condition. Because in a sense, you know, our activity was completely different. You know, we were dealing with, you know, like a different also spirituality. So sometimes, really sometimes, we had to fight, maybe one hour, one hour and a half, sometimes two hours before to have a breakthrough. As simple as that. Just, but not giving up. <laughs> trying, trying to push, you know, to have a breakthrough. And then, at that time, God gave us very practical advice and then people to see. To the point that, uh, for example, my brother and sister were asking me, uh, uh, what did you say uh, about that and that? And usually I always forgot. So then uh, they took, you know, pain, <laughs> and, and then to write it down, you know, to be able to, to guide. But truly practical advice, practical advice. And the spiritual is works with us in a very specific manner. I remember, you know, I had one time a very big dilemma. These four, like four officers who are dealing with our case directly. One of these officers is very negative. And the old way, you know, brainwashing, all this kind of thing. Really, but they are very negative. And I had to go to an appointment, but I didn't put it on this appointment. I wanted to see another body, another person within this office and then he managed for me to meet other persons that I already met and I knew how they were. So I didn't know what to do. Because I was, you know, this party of four officers were created after Vatican II for the unique purpose to have the Catholic Church to be linked to the world. One is for the culture. One is for the relationship with the non-believers. One is for the relationship with the believers, non-Christian. And one is for promoting Christian unity. So truly, how to go outside. And these four particular offices unite in order to condemn Father during the time he was in Danbury. So I knew they had to pay for it, 10 times. And because of their mistake, I knew great blessing will come anyway. But how to deal with it? So I was determined to go all over the place and to, to truly uh, denounce uh, the abuse of the power, the abuse of the, I was truly ready to do that if it's necessary, to say, look, 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 look what you do. You, know, you, you pretend to do that, and what you do with things is just to go against the other group. So that's a nonsense, and that's dishonor. So I was really ready to, ready to fight if it's necessary. Yeah? So, but I didn't know, you know if it's what God wants me to do. So, until the last moment, I did not know what to do with it. And truly was a, you know, and I, I, I was aware if I do a mistake, then <laughs> everybody in the Unification Church will hate me after that. Oh. Because you know, they will have trouble in their country. So I knew uh, somehow God has to help me. I will do everything he wants, but he has to, he has to help me. So I remember we gathered to pray, in order to prepare to go for this visit. And then we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and we pray, and then we stopped to pray. And then the time was over. You know, we just forgot ourselves in God. And then, and then because we truly wanted you know, God's inspiration, that we had to pray such a long time that it was too late to go. <laughs> so then no problem. So then we were free, okay, we didn't go, and then no problem. But the, the two other uh, secretariat, you know, which did uh, with our case, they were negative before. But we have to understand, in a sense, they don't know what to deal with all these religious group all over, and some of them, they're pretty much against them. So they, they never know how to deal with them. Yeah, they have problems. They are not always badly motivated. So I began to visit some people. When I say people, I say most seniors, uh, <laughs> so within the Christian, uh, of promoting Christian unity and the non-Christian department, eh? these two sectors. And they are the one mainly dealing with us. The other, they are participating to it. So after uh, the 40th day of the, the, the end of our 40 days condition, the 40th day, they, they met, you know, the two canons of, uh, of this congregation, and they nominated someone to be appointed as a person who will dialogue with us. 
So since this time on, this is four years days, we can uh, organize some meeting and then we can relay uh, to the Vatican. And then they, since then, we made quite a few times and then they were able to change. So we did a, quite, a, you know, quite a, a great uh, a activity here, but still it was growth period. So we, we met a lot of people and then we, we laid a good foundation. So when came the time of the fourth, third holiday, <laughs> we came back to 2.12 to 2. To <laughs> It was truly a time of incredible fulfillment. Like a, everything was going out in this place. And everything could be really kind of in control. So first of all, uh, the different uh, pontifical uh, university to the major one, we could establish a very good relationship with the president to the point that uh, in the two major uh, pontifical universities, the president himself accepted to study the Casa Mania. Wow. And then uh, he did so to the extent that they were really, really positive, really positive. And when uh, Ambassador Sanchez, that you know now, who is the president of Cosa USA, went to uh, our meeting in Rome, he was able to, uh, to meet one president of the university. And since then, they carried on their relationship. And it was such a great uh, meeting because they could talk together. You know, I set up the meeting, and then they could actually uh, exchange to the point that uh, this particular president is truly uh, on our side. Even though he remained a little quiet about it, he's still absolutely supportive. Also, uh, there is another person that you may know, Mother Teresa, you know her? Oh, yeah. I told you before that I didn't tell to any sisters and uh, any uh, nuns that uh, uh, who I was uh, from uh, which religious group, I didn't tell one thing. But since the very start, I met uh, Mother Teresa over one year ago, and since the very start, I told about father. So the first time I talked to her, she, she said, Moon, Moon from uh, New York or from the uh, say yeah. I said, oh, I said, well, you know, whatever you heard about him, I can tell you one thing, he's a good and great man. So please believe in that. So we, we, we came in our conversation. But since then, I'm pretty much serving. <laughs> and uh, when the Synod come, I will speak a little bit later about it. When the Synod comes, she came during 15 days in Rome. So, and then they have mass at 6.30 in the morning. So that became our standard morning service during that time. So we assisted to the mass. And uh, at the very beginning, almost nobody came. But you know, the words came around. <laughs> <laughs> we had more people go through their place. But what is great also that um, Mrs. Park was able to meet her and then uh, offer very beautiful uh, <coughs> flowers to her and have an exchange you know, about uh, the husband and different things. And also Abel Sanchez came to see her and then he explained that he was ambassador to Honduras. So, uh, then they already thought to do something in Honduras to help a kind of orphanage that uh, the sister have over there. And then since then, uh, the ambassador came uh, to, to Honduras, and then uh, we, we, we made uh, some kind of donation. And I reported a, little, a short time ago uh, to Mother Teresa, maybe two weeks ago. And then she was, uh, she was very happy, so, so she signed, uh, you know, the, the picture where we were, uh, you know, in Honduras. And also, uh, I tell you one thing that you don't know, and she may not be aware of, but she's also a Casa supporter. So we can see. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
So one uh, very significant meeting, uh, fishing, uh, we really get closer to her, and uh, so we continue to serve the sister, but we, you know, I have one, one dream, you know. I don't want this person to go into the spiritual world before to, to meet father. Mm. That's my, that, I don't want to, even to be my dream. I want just to have faith that it will happen. If we see this person, is just unbelievable person, unbelievable person. I tell you uh, the kind of uh, attitude she has. She gave uh, a little sermon at, at one end of the service, and she said things like, uh, we need a deep prayer line. If we need a deep prayer line, because that's the only way we can get some faith. And just through faith, we can actually attract God. And if we attract God, we can feel and have God's love. And it's by sharing God's love through service that we can experience joy. That's a divine principle, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of spiritual guidance she gives to, uh, to the nun. And I, I could see the nun, and that's why you know, something must happen. Because the nun, you know, they, they are, for me, I can understand, you know, they are not here because they have a vocation. They are here because they understood that's the way to find God. I can see, because they truly live uh, their face truly. So that's the kind of person Mother Teresa is. This kind of leader, spiritual leader, but this kind of unbelievable giving person, unbelievable giving. So don't you think that the only good thing which can happen at the end of her life is to meet the family? Don't you think that normally speaking, it's just uh, something which had to happen? It's, it's what I, I want always to, to stick on. I don't want to become too rational and say, look, look, what are you talking about? Okay. No, no, I know that this person, that already we have a very good relationship together. Last time she told me, uh, she looked at me and she told me, uh, she said, please, keep, keep a loving heart for others. So like, keep, keep your loving heart, keep your loving heart. So she's really like, a, she, she's special. And she is very in shock, and she is 75 years old, but still she's not uh, in the spiritual world yet. So she's very present, and she understands what's going on. I, I, I can share a little other secret for you. you know? <laughs> Last year, she already accepted to go to the World Media Conference. <laughs> okay, we canceled the World Media Conference, but she accepted. She accepted. And I remember when we asked her, she said, Look, I am not a journalist, I am a missionary. <laughs> what do you want to do? You, you three have to, to, to share something, and they have to be to you, these people, more than anybody else. So she is uh, this kind of person. So we continue, continue uh, to bring her closer to us. So also, uh, that's the time of Aula. As you do know, that uh, uh, Aula is a sister organization of, uh, of uh, Causa. And uh, we were able to visit the poll. Uh, Aula was received by the poll. And you have the participant here and got the back and phone. So you have also to understand the setting. Eh? Because we had uh, 14 former head of states, the Vatican as a state, on a diplomatic level, was in the position to receive this person. So it was not done on a religious level, but it was done to honor the work of these people for Latin America. So. Uh, that was the time also when we had a synod. As you know, uh, 20 years ago, we had a synod which was called Vatican II to change the church. Pope John Paul II called for an extraordinary synod in order to evaluate uh, what, uh, what is the implication on the different countries of Vatican II. So can you imagine, at the same time, the whole uh, heads of the Catholic Church of the world were in one place, Rome. <laughs> can you imagine? So I tell you, and uh, you may know that already, to meet, to meet one bishop or one archbishop in one country, it's so difficult sometimes, yes or not? Yes. Yeah. But they were all there and packed up sometimes in the same places. So we just had to call them and then, uh, you know, to see, for instance, uh, 
At 10 o'clock, uh, the bishop, uh, the bishop of cardinals, quite a few cardinals of uh, you know this country, of Indonesia, afterwards uh, Greece, after Pakistan, and it was just unbelievable, <laughs> one after the other. So, and we made one condition: you know, we always announce Father. Sure, we may have to find the best way to introduce at the right time within the conversation, but we always introduce Father. So that was absolutely incredible. I, I'd like to share just a brief experience with you with the Cardinal from Korea. You like to, to hear yeah. from him? His name is Cardinal Kim. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah, another Kim. So, uh, we had an appointment uh, in the morning, and he came, and one, once he, he kind of, uh, I don't know if you saw him, but kind of a serious look. So uh, we met each other, and uh, I began to joke a little bit, uh, saying, uh, uh, we say that the next probe will be coming from the Orient. <laughs> <laughs> so you don't want to deal uh, too much with it, uh, <laughs> and then, I began to explain, uh, you know, uh, I talked about Koza, and then, you know, pretty much uh, it was just waiting, you know, <laughs> see what will happen. But it was okay. So, and I say, uh, and the founder of Koza International is the Reverend San Mian Moon. <laughs> so he, he had already the manual, Koza manual, so he said, Unification Church. <laughs> <laughs> so he just, all of a sudden, got very awake and uh, you know, interested. And uh, I said, well, not exactly. Even though it's true that we don't, <laughs> this is something really different. But he was not. And then I, he felt impatient. So maybe he just forgot that he had an important appointment somewhere. <laughs> but he wanted to, to just go away. So and in my head, I said, well, I don't want to invite him in the first place. Because I said, you know, we have to be very careful with the four provincial nation. And I know that like, on Catholicism basis, they were so very tough. So, but anyway, my dear sister made, made an appointment, so I had two goals. But uh, uh, when I saw what happened, I felt a uh, mistake, mistake. Because when he left, he looked at the door, and he was thinking, how come he could enter in this place? It is a place reserved for the clergy. And how come he could do that? And I, I could see that he looked at you know, the main, uh, at, uh, like the doorman, and I was sure. My career is finished in this place because it will, you know, the Vatican, they have a good, uh, yeah, good security, good uh, you know, information system, but I, I am finished. Okay, I made a mistake. I don't know how I will do, but okay, let's carry on. So he, he went, he went, uh, and I was sure that, you know, what will happen? But in the very same day, I had other appointment in the same place. So I came back. <laughs> I came back, and of course, uh, one of the first people who was coming towards me, Kelly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I escaped and I forced the bathroom. <laughs> and then, uh, so I went back. So I, and, and, uh, okay, I took my my bishop or whatever. I put him on the corner, and then we began to speak. And then afterwards, okay, I had an appointment at six o'clock, just after the session of the synod with the Archbishop of Costa Rica. And he was coming with his beautiful robe and all this. So, and then my, myself, I was not very secure in this, uh, this place anymore. <laughs> so when it comes, so I kind of push him very quickly on the salon, and then hop, we had to, who is here with two Korean zones? <laughs> Kanyal Kim. <laughs> so I took that note. So let's go, let's go. So, so we went over there, but I could see him. <laughs> so I said, too bad, too bad. So I am. So let's finish my day. Let's do something. Else. So and um, it happened, you know. I said, and I thought, wait a minute, what's happening? I can do one step in this place without seeing um, this name, Kenya King. Said, better to change my strategy. So I said, now we continue the, the following day, and I saw him to come. Hello. <laughs> so so no, very free now. Then I okay. And, <laughs> so, so I said, okay, so the following day I said, now that's the time. So when he was coming, the third day I said, hello, Kalimatkin, how are you? <laughs> so he was, <laughs> but at one point I felt he just gave up speech. Yeah. Just gave up, he said, too much? I don't mean with this thing. just too much. But what I feel, it was very important, but he could see him right in the heart. 
of the Vatican, Father is here. And not only is here, but people, you know, know, uh, when I came to him, he could testify. I did not hide about Father. I say, Reverend Son Myung Moon. So he could see. So you could see that whenever I talk to one cardinal or the other from all this continent, I'm actually talking about uh, Reverend Sam Moon. Mm -hmm. And I have seen in my mind the beautiful pictures, beautiful pictures, because you know I could see quite a few cardinals and bishops coming home with the blue book of Causa. You know? <laughs> so, so I was wondering, you know, the, oh, one more, <laughs> one more, one more. So it was an extraordinary scenery, extraordinary scenery, really. And what, uh, what happened? Quite deep experience, because in some countries, the Catholic Church is a minority. Mm -hmm. So even a big cardinal, big problem. And then they, they have hard time. So in Pakistan, I remember like they, they, so the, the Archbishop of Athena in Greece, you know, like the Orthodox, you won't believe what they do to the Catholic over there. So, so they, they all have a, a very different uh, situation. But also, one of the most moving experiences I had is to meet cardinals and bishops from the Eastern, or even also from Russia. And one of the most, uh, I would say, striking experiences I have is when I met a bishop from Russia. In one of the provinces. And then speaking to him, he told me, look, look, what, what, what do you have to offer? If, I, if your society is decadent, if I see a young people in the street, the morality is decadent. And I feel so, so bad, in my, and as maybe we don't realize how much our world is sick. Because somebody persecuted comes into our world, and the free world, and doesn't want it. Yeah. You say, at least in my nation, the state is trying to do something about it. And I felt so, you know, we, we have a work to do as a cause of people and individual church people. We just, we, it's impossible to see somebody coming from Russia, so we risk persecuting, to come and say, look, your world is worse. Your world is worse. So this kind of experience where, uh, quite uh, moving and uh, enlightening also, but we really have to, to understand what's going on in our own world. And also one experience I had with a cardinal from, uh, from another, another communist country, and I had to have uh, somebody to help me, uh, because I don't speak German, so the only thing was to, to speak German. So I like uh, me, Margarita Kenustana. She, she was my interpreter, and since then she became part of the international in the Vatican. <laughs> she can tell you if I say the truth. <laughs> but then we met this particular bishop, uh, cardinal, and uh, when we began to speak, when he, he heard about our father, he didn't want, no, he just didn't want to leave. But uh, anyway, myself, deeply, I could not accept that him also, uh, he needs, and we are the only hope, him also uh, can go that way. For me, it was just impossible to accept. So, so we continue to speak, I testify to Father, I testify at this movement, that we care about them to the point that we don't, we, we want to liberate them. We don't even care about communism. It's like a cancer. We want just to get rid of it and then to liberate these people and then especially to liberate religious people for them to be able to take care of their country. So once he understood what is the vision in the heart of Father, he said, okay, if, uh, if it's like that, then I am 100% with you. And I sure can. I can do my things. And one of the most uh, also striking experience were the bishop and canal from Africa. Yeah. <laughs> they were incredible. Why? Because they were completely fed up with all this uh, talk, talk, intellectual talk. For them, the living God, <laughs> that's it. You have God, you don't have God, but why to speak about that, about that, about that? And they, they were really tired. You know? And they were cold <laughs> in Rome in December. So you know, it was quite easy you know, when we were speaking together. First thing, you know, they, they, didn't, they wanted to go out or they didn't want to go to the meeting. So that was their first impression that they had a hard time. But uh, also, I would say really 75% of them. Uh, understood what is causa, 
of course, knew about the father and truly, truly would like to do something with us in Africa. And when I say, you no, know, it's not nobody, for instance, Juan Carlos, and we had a very good relationship. You know, very, very, he's the, the Carlos from, uh, from Zaire, and this Carlos is the head of all bishops of Africa. Yeah? And he's willing to do something with us any time. And quite a few of them, because they see, you know, yeah, because they see, for instance, they have a lot of problems with the Muslims. What, how to bridge the gap between Christian and Muslim, so that the causa can be. Also, you know, uh, quite the young generation in Africa all mixed up. So many wars, so many, uh, so many problems with these changes, so, so many confusion. I mean, they all mixed up. So they said that they need like a new base to inspire the young people. So therefore, you have to know like uh, Africa is ready also to welcome causa. So I mean, our next step, we will go to Africa. So I wanted uh, basically to share this testimony to tell you one thing, that uh, everything is coming from inside. And everything, everything. And then afterwards, of course, we need some, some skills sometimes or some education. We have to know what to say, how to say, and with who. But every, everything is coming from the inside. And then if we can build up inside, then God can use us and we can fulfill our mission. Thank you very much for your time. by President Von Pilkin, but as much as we can, uh, we'll try to, uh, to answer. So, who is the first? Who is the most courageous? Uh, who is the one with the most? Uh, yeah? <laughs> in one of the cars, the lectures, uh, it was mentioned about uh, Marx's term of species essence, but if I remember correctly, it didn't explain what that was. What, what exactly is that? <coughs> There's so many questions about procedures and everything, it's nice to get a question about the lecture content. Uh, although I don't want to spend a lot of time <laughs> developing that. Actually, I, I think that the term, as it's found in Marx, is just uh, species being. And uh, it's, uh, it's supposedly what is unique about a human being is in his interrelationship with other members of his species. And so um, in the three documents from Bad Kreuznach, the Kreuznach manuscripts, and then in the uh, Paris manuscripts, he expounds on how the species being came to be alienated, or how man ceased to be a species being and um, came to be an alienated, isolated individual who had lost the proper relationship with other members of his species. So that term is actually discussed a little bit greater depth in the manual. And uh, the manual and the little pocket blue book are the very same text. So if you want to look in either one of those places, you'll find a little more uh, description about that. And also the magazine. In Dr. Lee's article in the English magazine, printed in New York, you'll find that particular uh, subject discussed. And everybody will be getting your manual as soon as possible. So if you don't have reference to one now, we'll get you one very soon. No question. <laughs> I don't believe you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. No, I mean, just a question, but maybe it's in the mind of most of us here. Is uh, uh, what next? I mean. <laughs> 
because of course we create setting a spirit here and uh, how to coordinate you know European work or because till now basically each country was very much uh, I think uh, separately individually and I of course I can speak um, from my own experience in Spain everything we did actually out of our own initiative and ideas and we never consult to anybody so uh, if this is supposed to be a kind of a starting point you know is there any kind of uh, you know elderly uh, leadership or what kind of connection will it be from now on this kind of I don't know if you can answer this or it's something to do with the one pill came but anyway something um, I just wanted to mention a, a couple of uh, a couple of points which I don't uh, it's not going to directly answer your question because I, I do think that uh, I think maybe Roger would like to share a few comments but also I feel that uh, um, we still need to understand more clearly like uh, Reverend Wong Phil Kim's direction. But I did want to mention one thing I think which is very, very important about what's next because I heard, uh, and, I mean, and when I mentioned this one, we, we start to see that there are literally, we could spend literally all day talking about other things. But um, I, I just happened to have heard some, some people speaking uh, this morning about uh, getting a cause of president for their country and uh, what would be the best kind of person to get as a council president for their country. I mean, obviously that's one thing that has to be done at some point in terms of, of the future work of CAUSA, is that you need to have a, a good CAUSA president. Um, but I, I just wanted to stress uh, not to do that too quickly. And uh, I just want to give you a few reasons why it might not be good, so good to do that too quickly. Um, Point number one is that we need to have, I think, best of all, an outside person as the president of CAUSA in our, in our specific countries. It's, it just is a lot easier. And also, that's a very powerful witness to Father. When someone comes and says, hey, is a Mooney Front organization, it's just a part of the Unification Church, and a person says, well, well that's interesting because I'm the president of CAUSA and I'm not a Unification Church member. You know? So I don't know why you're saying that this is a part of the Unification Church. I'm not a member of the Unification Church. And you heard like Ambassador Sanchez speak very, very uh, strongly the other day about the point that, you know, I'm a Catholic, I belong to a specific church. And this, this movement was founded by another specific church. But nevertheless, we can all work together because our goal was beyond a specific denomination. So, yeah, one thing is we have to get a good council leader. But uh, the one thing I like to stress is that that person should not be a Unification Church member. And uh, point number two, um, is that we should really make sure that that person has the right kind of spiritual disposition, you know. Um, I, I just want to really testify to Ambassador Sanchez. Actually, one of the main reasons we wanted him to come here was for you to get some idea of what kind of person is a good representative. Um, really, uh, Ambassador Sanchez is like a Mooney, you know. He's a Roman Catholic. He's never heard the divine principle, but he's really like a Mooney, you know. And uh, he's, he is in the sense that he's a, this is a man, I mean, maybe it's hard, it's hard to uh, really explain what kind of importance that he has in America. But uh, this is a man who uh, was, um, uh, he, he held one of the, you know, if, if you remember the 1960s in, in America, one of, the, one of the most important projects which was launched because of the inspiration of President Kennedy was the war on poverty. And uh, for years, people heard so much about it, and Ambassador Sanchez was the director of the War on Poverty. He had a budget of about $6 billion that he was responsible for in the United States every single year, a yearly budget of $6 billion. This is a man who, who's had two ambassadorial posts. He's a person who has a tremendous, tremendous importance, but the amazing thing is that he's extremely humble, I'm, I'm unusually humble and uh, unusually righteous and a very, a very, very good person. So I think point number one in the future when you look for your Khalid president is you want a person probably who should not be a Unification Church member and number two, a person who has a good spiritual dis uh, uh, disposition and number three, and this is also a very, very important person, a person who has real political weight. 
So I would not encourage you, I just want to give some examples. I would not encourage you to go home and say, well, um, we have a really good professor who would be a good president of Causa USA. He may be a very good professor, but, uh, but Ambassador Sanchez anytime can call the White House and they'll take his phone calls. Anytime. And, uh, and uh, when, we had, uh, when we had some difficulties with the, White House, what, with the White House briefings, you know, many people called and Ambassador Sanchez went there three times. And the person that caused us the trouble, uh, when he found out that Ambassador Sanchez was the president of Causa USA, uh, he, he quickly asked if he could please have lunch with Ambassador Sanchez because he understood, wait a second, there are 25 million Hispanics in America. This is the one, this is the Hispanic person in America who has had the highest political office of any of them. And so therefore, if he says something negative about us, we may, we may risk to lose the support of 25 million people. So we need him, you know? We can't just let him, let him go by. So you need, you need a person also has, who has real political weight, not, not just a person who is a professor or, uh, you don't, you don't, you don't, or not a person who was, um, you know, what, like, like a refugee from another country who knows communism very well or something. Those people don't have weight. We need a, we need a person who, who's been a part of the political scene. So uh, this is just one example of, of things you can talk about. But I, I would like to really, and actually if your national leader has gone back, but if you're from one of the countries, you know, uh, I would really encourage you because uh, very frankly, we suffered a lot in, in Causa in America because we didn't understand that point right away, that you, you've got to take time and find the right person, you know. And uh, we spent about two years before we finally realized that the kind of person that we needed was Ambassador Sanchez. And we watched him very, very closely for month after month after month. And then all of us together, we all came to the same conclusion. He's the man. He's the one that we need. So I, I really want to uh, just stress that point that don't pick too easily the president of cows in your country. That's a, that's a very, very precious post. <coughs> So what you can do in the meantime when you have your conferences, because, you know, uh, the next step I think is clear that uh, um, all of you have to develop as causal lecturers. And the step after you know the causal material is to start to have conferences. And in order to get people to come to the conference, you know, it's very helpful to have somebody who can write a letter who has a certain importance and who is going to be able to attract people to come to the conference. And so, I would suggest that instead of having a causa president in your country quickly, the first thing that you might want to have is a causa conference chairman. And you try this person for this conference, then your next conference try somebody else, try somebody else, try somebody else. And finally, you'll, you know, what we've discovered through the conferences also is that, you know, you, you start off and, and the first people there, they're on this level. Then the next level people, they're like this, and they're like this, and they're like this. Yes. And it's like constantly the quality of the people goes up and up and up and up, you know? And uh, it's really like the, the, the working of, of, a, of a spirit world. As time goes by, God gives us better and better and better people. So, you know, it's, it's this whole process. So I would really encourage you about this point. Don't pick too easily the council president in your country. Take, take your time. Have a conference chairman or whatever. And the church member, you, you'd be like the secretary general. You, you, you'd be the one that kind of controls this, the, the, the situation. But never, not, never in the front, you know. Never, we, we always step back, you know. We're, we're always behind. Ambassador Sanchez is the person who's, who's in the front. And uh, he is the one who deals with the public. He's the one that, uh, you know, that, uh, that really represents us best of all. Because people start to see that's not just for... Unification church members, it's for me, you know, and, and if that man is inspired by a cause, then I also have to think about it. So that's, I mean, those are just a couple of very specific points that, I, as I was sitting here, I, I just felt, I, I at least want to mention that before I go, because that's a part of our, our of our experience, is to really um, take that, that uh, those things in, into, into consideration. Another point I want to mention, this is a, this is a very technical point. And uh, we, we may not have been the best example in this conference, and actually I'm not being such a good example right now. And that is a question and answer session. You know, in an outside conference with outside people, um, we do not spend a lot of time on questions, and we do not spend a lot of time answering questions. And I, I'm, I'm sorry we spend a lot of time here, but in a, in a sense we have to almost. Quick answers to questions, you know, 
Because the real purpose of question and answer session is to let people speak. They've been listening for a long time, so to give them an opportunity to speak. So I just wanted to mention that as well. Yeah, just, um, no, I was asked already, like, uh, you know, my responsibility in Cosa International is international activity, which means that uh, I have a great deal of experiences to watch out the growth of the local chapter in many countries. So I have uh, had a great deal of experiences, and already we're thinking with uh, President King what would be the best way uh, Cosa International and myself could help to help you start it or develop activities or even to be connected to a certain level. Yes? Yes, please. <coughs> this is a bit different from what you said. Uh, also, to clarify this point, uh, Herbert Spencer maintained that uh, survival of the fittest should be employed in, uh, employed in human society. I would like to know the cause of the worldview on this. What can we do to reconcile between classes? Or uh, do we aim for a classless society, or is this dream never will be achieved? Oh, the question is uh, uh, about uh, the class, class system which is which is in our society. What is our view on it? Do we believe that a one class will be established at one point, or some kind of ideal? How do we decide between classes? Mm -hmm. This is one oh, question. Oh. Do we hope for a class society, or is it impossible? Oh, how can we reconcile between different classes, and do we hope for a classless society, or? to some other form of society. Mm -hmm. um, very briefly, I think that uh, the key, once again, is a change in, uh, in people's value perspective. And I think that uh, the point is that we have to reevaluate what uh, determines the greatness of a human being. And uh, what ultimately determines the greatness of a human being is the character of an individual. It's not, it's not the kind of job or whatever else that they happen to perform. It's their character. And uh, the tendency to, to see people from a perspective of class is it has to be, the way, that, the way that it has to be solved is that step by step we have to uh, encourage in society as a whole a new way of seeing the value of a human being. So one of the key points of the Causa worldview perspective is that it's helping people to understand that the real value of a person is not so much what they do, but the heart with which they do it. And I think that, uh, just very briefly, I think that's the point which we, which we step by step have to, have, to, have to change. And so the people who will be raised up before the eyes of, of, of humanity will be the people who do things with a godly heart, rather than the, than the people who belong to a certain class. But by the change in the value perspective, we'll begin to praise and respect and love and admire those who do things with a certain heart rather than merely those who perform a certain class level of fun function or activity. Uh, yeah. I think most of us here will be worried about the peace marches which are going on around Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, many of the ministers are involved with, with whether we have little practical guidance on whether to bring them into the general seminars or... Mm -hmm. points on this. The peace marches are the really big one. Yeah, uh, one of the big concerns uh, would be the peace marches in Europe. So do we have any kind of practical advice because uh, some of ministers are involved? Yeah. Well, I just was going to, I would like to make a general uh, remark. We haven't spoken very much about the International Security Council, which uh, originally began as a project of CAUSA International and now is, is still a project of CAUSA, but has very much taken on a, a certain particular role under Father. And um, Father has, is working with a, a gentleman named Dr. Joseph Cherba, and uh, Antonio Bettencourt is, is very much involved in that as well. And I think that uh, this is a, a very good source of information on issues such as disarmament or how peace can be achieved or peace can be maintained or, um, you know, just all the aspects of the Soviet military threat and so forth. So uh, 
um, this is a you know this is an educational resource that can be used in order so that ministers can be more aware of the facts because a lot of people are laboring under a great deal of ignorance and they're not involved in those things. So we should make available to you uh, at least the address and, and so forth of the International Security Council so that you can somehow get those publications on a regular basis. Also, I'd like to make a general comment on the question about the classless society. Um, <laughs> You know, I, actually, I'm not going to talk about the class of society, but just one comment. You know, when we describe what what Causa deals with, actually, is we're not dealing with the kingdom of heaven. Like, what will be the politics of the kingdom of heaven? What will be the economics of the kingdom of heaven? We're actually not discussing that. Uh, actually, what we're discussing, if you if you want to think of it in principle terms, it speaks about the final stage of preparation for the second coming of Christ. And it speaks that in that final stage, you have a, a kind of political democracy, you have a kind of democracy of religion where everyone has to study the Bible, and you have um, some kind of economic democracy, whatever that's supposed to be called. So that's, that is, in effect, what we're talking about. And we are not trying to describe what the kingdom of heaven will be like. So we're not elaborating uh, the kingdom of heaven so much. Yes. Just um, recently in Holland, the European Parliament they uh, they voted for, against the American uh, aid to Nicaragua, and I wondered what's your opinion or how that would actually affect the American political situation, or what your opinion is about that. Yeah, recently in Holland, the European Parliament voted against. Uh, some kind of AIDS or some kind of uh, help to Nicaragua. I mean, it's news for me. So I don't, and his question is, uh, how does this uh, have any kind of impact on the American public, uh, American opinion? Well, I just think that um, that uh, first of all, I think that you should do, that, that uh, it's good to know that the majority of the American people are opposed to aid to Nicaragua. The majority of American people are opposed to it, and the reason is because even the American people don't know the reality of what's going on in Nicaragua. You know? So it's not at all surprising that. Uh, Likewise, the European Parliament would make that kind of decision. Only a few months ago, our own Congress made that decision. You know, so um, basically, I think that President Reagan has a very strong feeling that uh, this is right, and also Father has a very strong feeling that this is right. Most important of all, and um, I think that uh, it just goes to show the need for education of both the American people and also the European people with respect to, to the reality of, of communism and likewise to the reality of what's going on in Central America today. You know, there was a survey in the United States and um, uh, I forget what it was, like 60% of the American people believe that the countries are communist. I mean, it's like an incredible, I mean, you just wouldn't believe it. Yeah, the, the level of confusion that there is, that's inside of America. So I'm not at all surprised that there's a confusion in Europe, you know. And, uh, and uh, President Reagan is going ahead with this, even though he knows that about, only about 38%, I believe, of the American people support uh, his policy in Nicaragua. So it's not, it's not surprising. It just shows we have a big task of education in it, all of us. This reminds me one uh, one comment I had to make after uh, Father Pena spoke. Uh, you are willing to use the information and even to quote his name, but please don't uh, don't speak about the setting in which you got the information. It means that you know he's speaking, so he doesn't mind to. Of course, if he speaks, it's for the truth to be known. So he wants you to use this information, but. Uh, uh, it cannot be public that it was within the Causa Seminar. That's all. Mm -hmm. Any other question? Two more. Yes? yes I'd just like to ask, um, what effect uh, American aid to Nicaragua, for example, uh, would have on Soviet-American relations? How do the Soviets see that kind of uh, the aid that we give to, that was given by the West yeah. to support uh, 
Uh, I'm sure. Your your question is exactly. I can hear. Um, um, how the Soviets view American aid to Nicaragua to support a movement, a rebel movement, to overthrow a communist government? How has the, the Soviet Union seen the effort of uh, the American to help the country uh, military? Well, I think it's something that the Soviets can understand. You know, seriously. I think that American behavior has been incomprehensible to them for a number of decades. They just cannot understand, really, what, what's going on in the United States, why they continue to give away the world. And so now the United States is behaving in a rational way and uh, putting up some kind of strong posture against Soviet expansionism. So I don't think that that's a destabilizing, uh, I don't think that's going to have a destabilizing effect. I think that's going to have actually a stabilizing effect because now American behavior will appear comprehensible to the Soviets, if you, if you know what I mean. So I would not buy the argument that that's going to now destabilize a relationship and that's going to throw a wrench into the understandings that have been reached. I think uh, relationships with the Soviets are always better when, when, there's a when we show a position of strength. Then from that point, relationships can be actually better. If anything, they can be more stable and reasonable than uh, if we present a continued sort of um, just, you know, irresistible vulnerability that they uh, always want to go after and attack. Yeah, maybe the two last one here and then after. Mm -hmm. uh, a few days ago, I was talking to somebody about uh, the dialectic. And, uh, we, we say that we... Uh, completely disagree with dialectic. This person gave me a, and we say that we must have cooperation, we must, uh, through mutual cooperation, this is the only way to change something. But this one person said to me, and I expect often other people get to answer this, uh, ask the same question, what happens if you meet a person who doesn't want to change, like some government or some dictator or something, how can you cooperate <coughs> mutually with this person who doesn't want to change? What's a good answer? Uh, yeah, so what happens in case of uh, you have to cooperate or you have in touch with uh, somebody who doesn't want to change, and especially if he's a leader, a dictator, or somebody like that? <laughs> the Soviet have an answer for it. I c maybe I can say something. I can try. <laughs> First of all, we need to have faith, right? That's one. one way or another, God will be able to work. And then, uh, second, you know, uh, because of uh, being involved with cause activities, and because if we understand Father's heart, uh, we cannot just do our best, but to, we have to be able to win the situation for Father. So whenever we have had the opportunity to be able to work, we did so. So I know that uh, even for some of you, it may not be very clear why we did work in uh, some country where uh, some people, whether they were the military or some dictator, were at the head of the government. But uh, we are like the Christian. The Christian, when they went somewhere, they never changed their words. They never changed. And then if somebody who is not that good gives you his, your, the, his children to be educated, then uh, if you truly love the country and love these people, then you will take this opportunity and try to have an impact on these people. We did that in some cases without ever being uh, within the act of the government. But being an educational uh, group, uh, organization, we really try to do to expand as much as we can, with especially at this point, you know, how hope is that people will change. Also, that may tell us uh, something about uh, even the leaders we want to raise. Many people change. You know, when they, the first time they hear Koza, the second, the second, they change. So we have to have also this hope that people can change. Actually, that, that's our only hope, <laughs> that people can change. 
I just want to add one other point, and uh, we're getting into something here that I don't know. I don't know how well you can articulate this to a, to an outside person, but I think we can understand. We can understand a lot from Jacob's course because uh, when uh, Jacob saw that Esau would not change, and that Esau was committed to kill him, Jacob cut off give and take from, uh, from Esau and he went away and he prepared himself over a certain period of time and at the end of that period of time then he went back and he had, uh, well Jacob had a lot of things going for him at that time and he had enough going for him at that time that suddenly it became clear to Esau that it was in his interest to open up and to establish a relationship with, uh, with uh, Jacob. And that's what Father did as well. But when, when they're at a point in Father's mission, when there was a, a lot of uh, the, the, the Korean Christianity was unable to, to receive him, Father went away. He went to America, and he, and he, worked, in, he worked in America, and uh, what, the victory was able to realize there, then he could go back to Korea, and, and some Korean people started to see it was in their interest to somehow connect to and to relate to, to Father. And also, Father cut off from the communist world in 19, uh, 1950. But at some point, he's going to come back. He's isolated himself, but he's building up something so that at some point it will be possible to take even the communist world and say, look, it's in your interest to have give and take with us. But there may be times when you've just got to isolate yourself from that particular force. And, uh, and, and maybe that force will decline when you isolate yourself from it. Maybe it will stay there. But in the meantime, if you have to finally reconcile yourself with that person, then you have to develop things which will make it in the interest of that person to establish a give and take relationship. Jacob could sacrifice many things but he couldn't sacrifice his principle that he he had he was a representative of God and likewise for us in dealing with different people we cannot sacrifice our principles you know like so if somebody doesn't want to change and, and, if, and if their standard is a wrong one we can't we cannot change because of that we have to go someplace and we, or, or do something else and then come back and approach that person again but our principles can't change only they have to see that it's more in their interest to begin to have a relationship with us you know we are pressed for time and uh, however you know uh, I didn't want to create the impression that that, that, that that question somehow throws a wrench in our whole idea I would just like to take what Tom said and, uh, and put it in the terms of the lecture, you know. Uh, that, that question does not, it, just because we hesitate and think a moment, it doesn't mean that it doesn't, uh, it can't be handled by our model. Uh, either you can, as Tom said, go away. In other words, it says very clearly that unless there's a, 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 a correlative base, you cannot set up a relationship at all. So unless there's a principal base, there cannot be a relationship. And uh, then if there is some kind of basis, then you enter into relationship, but we have to be the subject of it. And uh, for example, if, if the dictator, you said it like a dictator. Well, if the dictator can recognize the idea of mutual benefit, you know, then we can, from a subject position, we can lead him in a certain direction that we want to go. And uh, I think right-wing dictatorships are kind of like that. If the dictator is a, is a Marxist-Leninist, then it'll be very difficult to set up any kind of base. So we do not want to get in a position where we're just object and he's subject and he's leading us in his own direction. So in that case, it's like you have to separate. Uh, yeah. Just to give you, I don't, we don't want to stay too long. I just like to say, uh, you know, one perfect example would be Chile. We work in Chile, um, last, like in every other country in Latin America, but as we saw that uh, the government liked us to go their way, we decided to don't work anymore. So they follow a certain Isaiah's course, and then if they're quite down and then they're a little bit more open, then uh, we will come back. So the last question very quickly, because uh, we have to... Yeah, so far, there was very little success of uh, anti-communist uh, rebels to somehow win back one country which has been occupied by the communists. But uh, please correct me if I'm wrong, 
but I feel that in Angola and in Mozambique now some change is occurring. Could you verify this or not? One question is about, uh, so far, the rebels against the communist country they don't bring any success in their attempt to liberate the country. But uh, it seems to, to him that uh, if uh, Angola and Mozambique was helped or supported in some ways, they could do it. No, that's not a question. What's the question? What is the situation? What is the situation? In oh, oh, but, but what is, yeah, so far there were no success in their attempt, but the situation in Angola and Mozambique seems different. I don't know the situation about Mozambique enough because there's all kinds of crazy things going on with respect to Mozambique. And uh, one of the problems is that the United States just gave a considerable amount of money to Mozambique because they were somehow convinced that uh, by giving money to Mozambique then the country is going to change, you know, and it's going to become less Marxist in nature. Um, uh, I don't know whether that's true or not, I don't know enough of the situation is. But, uh, I don't think the rebels are going to be successful in Mozambique if, they're, if, if the Mozambique government is receiving not just Soviet aid but also U.S. aid, and that's what's happening right now there. And uh, with respect to uh, Angola, Dr. Pak held up yesterday one, uh, one poster, which I guess the only people in the front had a chance to see. Um, the very shameful problem with Angola is that basically the rebels in Angola are being financed by uh, Gulf oil. Actually, now it's Chevron Oil, which is an American oil company. The rebels. No, the main government. The main government. Sorry? It's not the rebels. It's the main government. Yeah, no, I meant the main government. Yes, exactly. Thank you. <laughs> the, the main government is being, is being financed by Chevron Oil, actually. And uh, the real key to bring down the Angola government is one thing, and that is pressure to force Chevron and the Gulf uh, to uh, pull out of there. They have to pull out. So um, I think if that happens, and, and by the way, Savimbi is very focused on this too because he knows it's the issue. If that happens, then I think that the situation will be changed dramatically in Angola and there's a chance. But so long as every single, I don't know if you can believe this, but every single Cuban soldier inside of Angola today, and I believe there's about 20,000, every, every single Cuban soldier uh, allows the Cuban government to receive $52 a day from uh, the Angolan government, and that money is actually coming from uh, Gulf Oil. So uh, the, the, if, if, uh, if, somehow, if, if somehow Chevron and Gulf are forced to pull out, and then if somebody else comes in there, and, and, and if, uh, if somehow that, they start to bomb the oil fields and things, and people start to get scared and say it's not in our interest anymore, that would really be the turning point, I, I think. But until that happens, I don't think that uh, it's, it's going to be turned around. There's hope, but it, it can't really be turned around until the West stops supporting Angola. So I have now an announcement. Um, so, uh, Mr. Mori is another testimony of father's uh, heart for Europe because uh, he basically had uh, an opportunity almost to start a political action with the uh, IFVOC in, uh, in his country. So he's definitely a, uh, a person who can give a great input in our cause I work, especially in England. So but before he comes uh, to the podium, I'd like to ask... Um, uh, as a request of President Kim, the following person to attend a meeting with him uh, before to have a general meeting at four. So now you will hear Mr. Mori, and then after a break, please come back at four o'clock where President Von Pink Kim would like to, to give his closing remark. But if the, the, COSA, the national leaders or the COSA representative of each country, if the national leaders... それでは、あの、証しでなって、
選挙の報告をしたいと思います。Uh, this time, uh, I want to report the result of election in Japan this time instead of testimony about the two terms. 昨日パク先生がお話になりましたけれども、選挙の結果は、私たちの支援する自由民主党が圧倒的に勝利をいたしました。Uh, as Dr. Park mentioned yesterday, uh, uh, this time uh, Japanese Conservative Party, uh, Liberal Democratic Party really got a total victory. In 1955, the Jewish people have been elected. Uh, really, this is a very historical victory. Uh, since this party uh, was established, uh, it is a really, uh, really complete victory. Very, very, uh, it's the first time to get uh, such a victory in this time. So, it was 300 people who were in the middle of the world. The seat number is、uh, 300 seats. The Jimmy's and 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 Jimmy's. Uh, their goal was、uh, 257, yes. but、uh, eventually they got 300. <laughs> and then, uh, so far,、uh, this uh, party had、uh, 250. In this sense, 50, 50,、uh, 50 seats、uh, are there.、Oh. えー、この衆議院の総数は五百十一議席であります。十一です。で、あ、the the all あ、こんで、反省。all seat of this house of、uh, house of representative is five hundred twelve seat。で、three hundred is。え、今回の選挙にお父様はものすごい思いを寄せておられたわけであります。To father really concerned about this election very very much. Three years ago, my father was very concerned about this election. Three years ago, my father was very concerned about this election. Three years ago, my father was very concerned about this election. Three years ago, my father was very concerned about this election. Three years ago, my father was very concerned about でそのうちの一人が我々統一教会を弾圧するであろうとレノリって言います。One of this ga one of government which will realize in after Nagasone will accuse unification church. で特に経済問題でハッピーワールドに対して弾圧をかけるという可能性がありました。Concerned about happy world, they will really attack this our economic movement. そうすると世界の秩序が非常に難しくなるわけであります。As you know, if we are attacked by, we will be attacked by this、uh, government, our worldwide providence will really da will be damaged. それで日本の商協連合では今年の初めからこの選挙のために準備をしてまいりました。Uh, because of this reason,、uh, our members of、uh, Japanese VOC International really prepared. Uh, for this uh, election. Uh, uh, as you know, we have already the foundation of VOC, uh, uh, seven million members. で、えー、そのもとに、えー、そのために、えー、450の、uh, ブランチとそれから、えー、10万の班、uh, があります。So for support this, uh, uh, to to organize this number, seven、uh, million members,、uh, we have four hundred fifty branches and a ten thousand and a hundred thousand group of small party. で日本の商協連合では半年間、えー、この半の組織を固めることに、えー、集中してまいりました。During six months for this election, really our member really c o n c e n t r a t e d to organize this small、uh, groups. でこのように700万の組織はすなわち、えー、選挙のためであります。So this 
seven million member of VOC is really for the election. で結局この勝共の700万組織を教育することによって自民党を勝利させることができたのであります。そう、あ、because of our good result to educate these people, because of this result of our members of VOC, this time we got such a、uh, big victory. でもう一つの勝利の要因、それはすなわち、えー、中曽根総理の首相の信仰にあると思います。そう。I can、uh, say another point that we, why we could get such a victory because Mr. Nagasone has a really.、Uh, maybe, we, maybe we can say his faith. To be honest, the most important mission is to be able to do this. This is the most important mission. Uh, really, uh, Mr. Nagasone helped us to. Uh, to help、uh, through Father to get us d o n very. To, I think, to Mr. Reagan. Mr. Nagasone, you know, 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 President of Reagan directly by himself. The Korta Kota of two Ikokno top to Dewa, the Kinai, Ikokno top to Ga, a story no Shuko Dantai, a Spanish family, Naskota, the Kinai to the Amas. So normally this is a very impossible that one national leader、uh, to form another national leader, a、uh, president, for one person who are religious leader. もう一つは中曽根総理は日本の久保木会長と完全に一体化しております。そう、ミスター中曽根はそう、really unite completely with our leader、ミスター久保木。彼はこの、それからもう一つは、選挙の前にお父様は日本の国会議員を教育しなさいと申し上げました。So before this election, father gave us one direction to educate. それで約60名の国会議員が韓国に参りました。で、メンバーズ・オブ・コングレスマン・ウェント・コリア。そこで、えー、パク先生から、カウさんの世界の活動状況をお聞きしました。So they really had a report about all our activities in the world about culture from Dr. Park. そしてミスター小山田、ミスター梶栗から原理、そして勝共カウサリオンを聞いたのであります。And Mr. 小山田、Vice President of Japanese Church and Mr. 梶栗 gave also lecture of divine principle and also VOC lecture。で彼はサインをしました。コムネス。So this sixty Congress A member of Congress, a parliament, sign in one paper maybe after this conference. The s e c o n d i a is, uh, Jun is, uh, Bun s e n s e i and the Kuo k a i c h o a t s So they、uh, accepted that really we will work for Japanese Sun Yung Moon with. Mr. Kuboki.、Oh. Wow. <laughs> 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 お父様の市場命令であります。この議員を必ず通さなければいけないということであります。<laughs> 通さなければいけない。この小山議員を絶対に通しなさいという命令であります。<laughs> <laughs> <laughs> そうですね。そう、father really asked the leader of VOC、uh, that.、Uh, You must really、uh, make them members of parliament, these 60, uh, people, uh, 60 uh, members of this parliament. The King of Dustach, the Shugin, the Hakrukujuch, the King of 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 the King of
、えー、そのために私たちの私区が、えー、5000ないし6000名のフル,タイフルタイムメンバーがあー彼らに応援したわけになります。So for this, uh, support, uh, this election, uh, five or six、uh, thousand our members will be supported for this campaign.、えー中曽根総理は、後期会長と約束をしております。ミスター中曽根、ハードワン、プロミス、ウィズ、ミスター久保木。もし今度の選挙に、えー、勝ったならば、えー、自分はあもう一度、二か、二か、もう一度二年やりたいという決意をいたしています。そう、ああ、if、uh,。ミスター中曽根 can get win、total win、あ、victory in this election。Uh, he will continue again two years as a prime minister of the Japanese Congress. 自由民主党の規則は、中曽根総理の任期は今年の10月で終わります。ノーマリー、今、オクトーバー、ヒーズ、ピアリオ、as a prime minister will over. しかし、今度の選挙を勝利することによって、おそらく彼は、もう一度、自民党、総理に選ばれる可能性が十分にあります。ビコードのサッチャートータルビクトリーですタイム。It it will be sure he will be again the prime minister of Japan。でもし自分がもう一度総理になったときには、消協連合が推進しているスパイ防止法を必ず通すとこのように約束しています。So this is the promise that if he can be again the prime minister of Japanese Congress,、uh, he really Uh, pass the anti spy law as you know. In no Congress. The Nihon is a good thing. Spy Bosch is a good thing. Maybe we can say in another word, anti spy law. Maybe we can say in another word, anti spy law. In France or another country. But Japan is a very special country.、Uh, until today, we don't have such a law. Mean, Like a parasite of spy in Japan. So, the Soleil, KGB, Ariba, Kyo San, and the Shakai, and the Maskum, and the Korean Hantai, and the Maskum. So, for this、uh, new law,、uh, communists, of course, socialists, and the KGB behind, all these、uh, communistic people really against to and stop to pass this law in our Congress. しかし、われわれの運動によって、すでに国会に提案されたのであります。So, this time, uh, by our movement, uh, this uh, concept of uh, Liberal Democratic Party uh, put this subject to discuss in Parliament. At this point, we could reach it. もしスパイ防止法が取りますと、次は憲法を改正することが。我々の願いであり、また中曽根首相の願いでもあります。So if we can be successful, will be successful to pass this anti-spy law. So next our goal is to change our constitution. すなわち憲法改正。憲法は国の原理であります。国家の原理。So constitution is very very basic for our Or each nation, very important. で、私の願い、それは何か、その国家原理に統一理論を入れること、すなわち統一理論を持って国家原理、憲法を作る、これが我々の願いであります。So, our, our purpose is to put our、uh, ideology, Godism, into this new. Constitution. Constitution. しかもそれが今度の自民党が参加取るとって非常に可能になってまいりました。So this time I explained already three hundred seats. Because of this victory, we now we can see future. That we will really, we are really be able to get this goal. So, we are our members three women are elected. So, this time three of our sisters are candidates. 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 This time three of our sisters are candidates.
しかしあ,あ,あるシスターは7万の票を取っておりますこの選挙では約4年間の準備を行いますノーマリーフォーワンエレクション、イーチメンバーマスクリペア、ドリンフォーイヤーズ、ディアレクティブ。しかし、我々はこのか、えー、今回はわずかに20日間しか準備をし,しませんでした。1年、2年していけば、必ず多くのメンバーが通るということを確信するわけであります。お父様は日本の会議に200名を獲得しようというこのような言葉があります。今の日本の状況は我々は十分にそれをなすことができると考えています。So, I believe that it will be really possible in the future by our foundation and by our movement. ということは、日本におきまして70名の国会議員を握れば総理大臣になれ,なれることができるのであります。なることができます。So, if we can have 70 parliament of、uh, member of parliament, We can really have our prime minister with this foundation, if possible. もし200名取ったら我々は我々の願うところの人が総理大臣になるのはこれは良いであると考えられます。By 200 member of parliament, really it is no problem.